You walk in the park and stop because you come across the cutest puppy. While admiring it, you notice a red collar, and remember, red is the universal sign for stop. All over the world, you see it on stop signs and stoplights. This cute pup is one you shouldn't get too close to. A red collar on a dog signals that the animal is aggressive and should be given space by humans and other animals. These dogs may be more likely to snap, bite, or lunge at any passers-by. You may find this hard to believe given how happy the dog might look when you see it with its handler. You're right, it probably is delighted because it loves its owner and may also be super protective of them. It's also possible that the dog may be an assistance dog. However, these dogs should wear a vest with emotional support or assistance dog written on them. Oh, and please remember three important words. Do not pet. Not all dog owners opt to use color-coded language with their pets. It's often used more in professional environments. For example, if a dog and their sniffer are required for scent work, they probably have better things to do than getting belly rubs from strangers. The red collar might now serve as your fair warning. It's a fact that dogs have up to 300 million olfactory receptors in their noses. Humans have roughly 6 million. It means that their sense of smell is about 50 times better than ours. The part of a dog's brain devoted to analyzing smells is about 40 times greater than ours. Dogs are attracted to new odors. There's a good chance they'd prefer a sniffing session to your offer of a belly rub. It could just annoy them. Why don't we take a look at some other things that can irritate your dog? This first one might hurt your feelings and be hard to accept. Have you ever noticed your dog freezing in terror when you go to hug it? Have you ever wondered why? Dogs just don't like it when you hug them. Research has shown you should never constrain your dog, which is exactly what happens when you hug them. If your dog comes looking for it, then okay. But otherwise, a pat on the head will be enough. None of us like returning home to find our beautiful furniture chewed to pieces or discovering that our brand new shoes are ruined. But one thing you shouldn't do is yell at your dog, even if they chewed your favorite and most expensive shoes. Yelling just confuses the dog. Dogs may simply think you're barking at them and start wondering what's happened to its human. I know those puppy eyes are beautiful and hard to look away from, but try not to stare at them for too long. Prolonged eye contact can be another form of aggression to our loyal companions. This even applies to your own dog, who may get spooked by your serious demeanor. This is especially true with strange dogs who may be anxious or uneasy with your presence. Try to distract yourself from looking at them by simply focusing on stroking that warm, cuddly fur. What else annoys your dog? Whilst your furry friend may be perfectly okay with having extremely oversized nails, one thing they're often not okay with is their owners trying to clip them. Research suggests that dogs hate getting their nails clipped, ears checked, and mouth examined. However, these things have to happen as overgrown nails could hurt your dog, and checking their ears could prevent nasty ear infections. It's good to get your dog comfortable with you touching their feet and ears before taking them to your local groomer or trying to cut nails yourself. Being a responsible dog owner is by making sure that they get enough exercise. And dogs always love a walk, right? Well, not always. Let's be practical about this. You're at the beach on a sunny day. You walk on the sand barefoot and suddenly you feel your feet burning. You quickly struggle back to your towel. See where I'm going with this? If it's too hot for your feet, it's probably too hot for your dog's paws. And it's not just burning feet you need to be worried about. The heat itself can harm your dog. Dogs can cool themselves by panting. However, this method is not too effective in hot weather. By moving your dog walking sessions to early mornings or late afternoons, you could be doing that puppy of yours a big favor. Variety is the spice of life, and don't think this doesn't apply to dogs especially when it comes to the games you play with them. When we think of games to play with our dogs, the best most of us can come up with is fetch. We're not the ones that have to desperately chase after the ball, so this is quite convenient. Be more creative. Try some other games, one of which is tug of war, which involves equal effort from both dog and human. Dogs love this game and contrary to popular belief, it has no connection to aggression especially if you alternate between who wins each round. This game will also teach your dog a vital skill in impulse control. Games that end early will teach your dog the difference between what's acceptable and what isn't. 
You can also play training games with your dog. Giving your dog a treat when they look at you without being asked to will enable you to have more control over them. Although they're animals, dogs do have some traits in common with humans. Example, they won't get along with everybody, so don't try to force a dog into a friendship with another dog. Some dogs are shy, whilst others are social butterflies. Our job as responsible pet owners is to find out how we can make our dogs comfortable. Dogs have different levels of confidence. One dog may be fine with another dog, but become uncomfortable in a group bigger than two. It's sometimes best to create a small group of dog friends for your dog to play with, or just introduce them to new dogs one at a time. But forcing them into uncomfortable situations is a no-go. One thing we're all at sometimes reluctant towards is change. One thing that a dog loves to do is to make their owner happy. So if your dog's not listening to you, there's a good chance it's because your rules aren't consistent enough. Consistency is something that dogs love. It allows them to know how to behave in different situations. Telling them to lay down after previously using the word sit can cause major confusion. As a matter of fact, you should probably make a daily schedule for your dog. This will prevent your dog expecting a game of tug of war when you're trying to get ready for work. And one thing you need to put into the schedule is some time outside of the house. This will teach your dog how to behave in new environments. You can't just expect your dog to enter one of the many dog-friendly cafes that now exist and know how to be a good girl or boy. Take baby steps. If your dog becomes excited, you're moving too fast. Oh, and don't forget those yummy treats to reward your pooch for good behavior. With all of the attention our dogs pay to ourselves, it's only fair that we should try to do the very same with them. Not paying attention to your dog's body language isn't good. Just because they don't speak a language doesn't mean you can't tell what's going on inside their head. Research shows that dogs speak with their bodies. Although some behavior like leaning in for more attention are pretty universal, dogs have very different ways of showing their anxiety, from freezing in place to an odd tail wag. A dog's eyes, tail, and ears, and posture are key to understanding how your pet is feeling. Paying close attention to how your dog responds to different social settings will also allow you to prevent any uncomfortable situations moving forward. The most obvious thing your dog doesn't like? Being ignored. Neither dogs nor humans have the energy to play all day, but time does need to be carved out of your schedule for some one-on-one -on -one bonding. Food and shelter isn't the only thing these creatures need. This is especially true when adding a new dog to your home. Dogs may also feel left out. Please make sure the older dog doesn't feel unloved. Wait, don't tell me that life on Earth has bubbled for about 3.5 billion years and the biggest creature we got is the blue whale? I mean, not bad, but that doesn't sound nearly as fun as those cool giant creatures you get to see in movies. Yeah, you recognize the iconic roar here. It appeared on TV, in comic books, in video games, and in cinema. I mean, come on, it even got its own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame on its 50th birthday. So, what would it take to get good old Godzilla from the TV screen to our streets? And we're talking about the beast that's really gigantic. In the original film from 1954, Godzilla was thought to be 164 feet tall. This was the perfect height for the monster to just peer over the biggest buildings in Tokyo at the time. But as further movies came, Godzilla became bigger and bigger. In theory, this would be the biggest animal that could exist and not end up crushed by the gravitational field of our planet. Even if we're talking about some tiny Godzilla of, let's say, 14,000 tons. To take the gravitational force of our planet and carry such weight, Godzilla must have some incredibly strong bones. And as an object gets bigger, its volume will actually increase faster than its surface area. Okay, wait, let's start small. So cells are the building blocks of life, and they come in all shapes and sizes. But the thing is, cells have a problem when they try to grow too big. As they grow, their surface area, the outside, doesn't keep up with their volume which means the inside. It's like having a big mouth, but a tiny stomach. You can't digest all the food you want to eat. Ugh, why haven't I learned that already? 
especially when I open my fridge for a midnight snack. So, if cells get too big, they can't get enough nutrients in and waste out fast enough. It would be like living in a very big house, but with just one tiny door to go in and out. Plus, that's not their only problem. Cells also need to be able to divide and replicate. And this task gets tricky as they get bigger. They need this thing called microtubules for that. It's sort of like a skeleton that gives them structure. But don't worry, evolution is a foxy little thing. There are some cells out there, like a specific type of invasive algae, that have found ways to break the rules and get really big. And they don't even need to divide to do that. This algae could pass as an aquatic fern that has fronds up to 31 inches long. But what you're looking at is just one big cell. It has multiple nuclei, though, which are like the control centers of cells. Plus, there are even some bacteria that are living in a symbiotic relationship with the organism, which means they help each other out when necessary. It's like having a bunch of different rooms inside one big house, with some roommates living there that help around from time to time. Then there's a monster alga known as the Sailor's Eyeball, which is like a giant ball of green slime. It can grow up to two inches in diameter, but is also considered to be just a single cell. My personal favorite would be this one. Again, we're talking about a single cell, but check out its stem and cap. It looks like a tiny little umbrella. It can grow up to four inches tall, which is definitely not bad for a single cell. Most cells are too small to see with the naked eye, but these fellas don't hesitate to break the rules. Now, when it comes to animals getting really big, there's a limit to their size. It's like trying to build a really tall tower. Eventually, it'll become too heavy and the base won't be able to support the weight anymore. Similarly, when an animal gets really big, its bones and muscles have to evolve to support all that weight, and it becomes more and more difficult to do so. In one of the movies, Godzilla was 390 feet tall. At that size, it would be really difficult for its heart to pump blood to its brain. And if it was a reptile, Godzilla would need to spend all of its time lying in the sun to stay warm. So we'd have to hide in the shadows, hoping some bigger animals that live in warm areas could keep it full. If Godzilla was a mammal, though, it would generate too much body heat and end up cooking itself. The biggest land animals we know of were sauropods, a type of dinosaur with a really long neck and tail. They could grow up to 131 feet long and weigh up to 70 tons, which could be as heavy as 10 elephants. Evolution was pretty efficient when it had to come up with its body plan. Sauropods ate plants. They had a smart way of eating that allowed them to stay in one spot and still find enough food. They could move their long necks around to reach plants so they didn't have to walk around too much or waste too much energy. Yeah, my kind of folks. That's impressive, but let's get realistic. Not many giant animals are happy to eat salad for dinner. If you had a giant beast such as Godzilla, you can expect it to go after its prey. And that becomes too hard for its body to support all that weight and perform all the necessary activities. The largest meat-eating dinosaurs were still pretty big, but not as big as the sauropods. The biggest one we know of is a fella called Spinosaurus, which was about 50 feet long. It managed to survive by eating fish and some other creatures that lived in the water. It would be so cool to have Godzilla in real life, if you have some safe basement where it won't find you, of course. But it's not likely some animal could really get bigger than our beloved sauropod. At least, not without running into some serious physical limitations. And have you ever wondered how big a plant could get? It turns out some trees have already reached amazing heights, such as the General Sherman, the largest living tree on the planet. It's more than 275 feet tall and has nearly 53,000 cubic feet of wood. It's gigantic, but still a little bit smaller than the Lindsay Creek French tree the biggest tree ever recorded. It was a coast redwood 
390 feet tall and had a volume of more than 90,000 cubic feet, which is as big as some skyscrapers. But it ain't easy for plants to get big either. When they're tall, it's tricky for them to get water from the roots to the leaves. Redwoods have a couple of tricks up their sleeves, though. For example, they absorb moisture from fog through their leaves. Plus, they have a wide base that gives them more support. If we want to build taller buildings, we also need to think about the challenges plants face, like how to build a good base that will support the structure and transport water and nutrients. If we're not just looking for height, we can take a peek at other massive organisms on our home planet, such as Pando. This is a male aspen forest in Utah that covers 107 acres and is basically one giant organism. It weighs almost 6,000 tons and is one of the biggest organisms on Earth. Perfect salad bowl for Godzilla. I mean, plants aren't the only organisms that can grow to massive sizes. There are fungi, like the honey mushroom, that can grow into a network of tiny threads called hyphae. They tend to spread out over big areas, and it's like a pretty big underground web, connecting everything together. One specimen in Michigan covers 90 acres and weighs about 400 tons. Now that's a lot of mushrooms. Squirrels' teeth never stop growing, but the animals wear them down by gnawing on nuts and other hard foods. The front of the rodent's teeth is actually orange. It's because they're covered in special tough enamel. Bet you're glad you don't have that to deal with. Some bird species don't mind munching on chili peppers. That's because they can't feel the heat. Peppers burn your mouth because they contain a special chemical, capsaicin. But birds don't have the taste buds needed to feel its effects. The rhino's horn is made of hair, or at least the same protein that makes up your hair and nails. This protein is called keratin. Such a horn is kind of unique since other animals have horns with a bony center. The woodpecker can peck the wood 20 times per second. This pace is almost too high for the human eye to notice. How much wood would a woodpecker peck if a woodpecker could peck wood? The number of pecks often reaches a total of 8,000 to 12,000 a day. A starfish does have eyes one on the end of each of its arms. These eyes are light-sensitive groups of cells. Frogs don't need to drink water. Instead, they have an area known as the drinking patch. It's on their bellies and thighs. They use it to absorb water directly through the skin. Well, that could save some time. Most caterpillar species have around 4,000 muscles in their body, and almost 250 of them are in the head alone. Christmas tree worms are much more beautiful than you can imagine. But even though the pines look awesome, two-thirds of the worm's body is hidden in a calcium carbonite tube. And the point of this is… I don't have one. Narwhals' famous tusks are actually their teeth that are kind of turned inside out. These unicorns of the sea have just two teeth. And in males, one of them grows right through their upper lip. Unlike your teeth. This one is tough inside and sensitive and soft on the outside. The anteater doesn't have teeth, but it's not a problem. This creature has a super long tongue. This tongue helps the animal lap up more than 35,000 termites and ants every day. Now well, that's one way to lick hunger. The flea can jump more than 200 times their body length. If humans had such an ability, they would jump as high as the Empire State Building. Woohoo! The red-eyed tree frog's eggs can hatch earlier if they sense their environment isn't safe. Small animals with fast metabolism see in slow-mo. This helps them escape larger creatures. Koalas' fingerprints are very, very similar to the human ones. Sometimes these animals' fingerprints even get confused at crime scenes, probably in Australia. The hippo's sweat is pink and not exactly sweat. It's a reddish, oily fluid. Its function is to not cool the body, but to moisturize the skin and protect it. This fluid also functions as an antibiotic. So, you get sunburn or cut, you can smear a hippo all over you. Polar bear skin is black, and the hairs of their coat are hollow and almost see-through. These animals have fur growing even on the bottom of their paws. 
This gives them a better grip on ice and protects against cold. Some species of tarantulas, some of the largest spiders in the world, can live without food for more than two years. I still think they're creepy. Platypuses close their eyes while kissing. Uh, I mean, swimming. They have special folds of skin covering their ears and eyes. They prevent water from getting inside. These animals' nostrils also have a watertight seal. Emus can't walk backwards, but scientists aren't sure why. These flightless birds are the only ones that have calf muscles. Emus can sprint really fast. They can also travel long distances, but they can't back up. Crocodiles can't move their tongue because it's attached to the mouth roof. It keeps the throat closed and protects the animal's airway. Water snakes, dolphins, whales, alligators, crocodiles, and turtles can drown. It'll happen if they stay underwater for too long. These animals can't breathe in the water. They can just hold their breath for a very long time. Only one species of birds can fly backwards. That's hummingbirds. Hey, go talk to the emu. These tiny birds can also beat their wings up to 80 times per second. Despite what elephant shrews look like, these small animals are more closely related to elephants than shrews. Maybe that's why they have their trademark trunk-like noses. Elephant shrews use them to munch on insects. True enough. Cats, as well as other felines, can't taste sweet things. They don't have the taste buds needed for that. Too bad, more for me. Flamingos can only eat with their heads upside down. That's why their lower bill is massive and their upper bill isn't fixed. Such an arrangement is perfect for upside-down feeding. But it's the opposite of what other birds have. It's not easy being pink. Tiger skin is as striped as their fur. That's all I have to say about that. When toucans sleep, they curl into pretty tight balls. These birds can turn their head so that their tail covers their head and the beak rests on the back. So yeah, they have a ball. The ostrich has some of the largest eyes in the animal kingdom. They're more massive than a bird's brain. Each eye is as big as a billiard ball. All clownfish get born male, but in some circumstances, they can turn into females. This change is irreversible. Unlike most fish, when seahorses mate, they do it for life. Even cuter, when the mates travel, they move side by side and often hold on to each other's tails. The male usually gets stuck schlepping the luggage. Termites never sleep. They don't need to recharge their batteries. But they can eat 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, on your house. The sloth needs up to 2 weeks to digest its food. Hey, take your time, no hurry, nothing on the schedule. Dogs' nose prints can be used for their identification. They are similar to human fingerprints and unique for each animal. Owls don't have eyeballs. Instead, they have eye tubes that don't move in the eye sockets. Penguins don't have external ears, but their hearing is especially sharp. Especially when they're on the lookout for polar bears. Shh, let's not tell them. Jellyfish are up to 98% water. That's why when they get washed ashore, their bodies can evaporate into the air after just a few hours. If a traffic jam happens underwater, an alligator will always give way to a manatee. Nice manners. Grizzly bears have such a strong bite that they can crush a bowling ball. So it's smart just to let them win. Giant pandas aren't picky about their sleeping spots. They usually fall asleep wherever they are, in most cases, right on the forest floor. The giant panda's newborn cubs are tiny. They weigh like a small cup of coffee and are smaller than a mouse. The red handfish can walk along the ocean floor with the help of its hands. But of course, they are not hands, but evolved fins, really. Cats don't usually meow at each other. A study has shown the felines use this way of communication mostly to get attention from us humans. And it works. Sloths can't shiver. It's not that they're too busy digesting that two-week-old meal. Their fur is sometimes covered with algae. And when they get too hot or too cold, their metabolism shuts down. 
During the hard times, immortal jellyfish transform themselves back into their younger state. Once they reach the stage when they're nothing but a blob of tissue, like me, these creatures start to grow again, and this process can apparently repeat again and again. The closest living relatives of the T-Rex are chickens and ostriches. Don't turn your back. The moray eel has another set of jaws that can extend from his throat. First, the main jaws close around an unlucky sea creature. Then the additional set grabs the eel's future meal with backward-pointing razor-sharp teeth. And after that, the captured animal gets dragged back into the eel's throat. I just lost my appetite. Some species of snails have hairy shells. Thanks to these hairs, snails can better stick to wet surfaces. When humpback whales hunt, they often gather in a group and apply a bubble net tactic to catch their food. The bubbles don't let the schools of fish get away. Snow leopards can't roar like other large felines. It has to do with their less developed vocal cords. But these animals can meow, growl, hiss, and even purr. Not to drift away from their group while napping, sea otters hold hands. They can also entangle themselves in giant seaweed for the same purpose. Hey, it kelps. Lions are often called the king of the prairie. I thought it was the king of the jungle. And still, up to 90% of all the hunting in the pride is done by the females. The males are in charge of protecting the territory and the pride members. And they make the delicious potato salad known as Hakuna Matator. Cats are famous for their uncanny ability to move their ears. All because kitties have 32 muscles in each outer ear. Some shark species can glow in the dark. Unfortunately, only other sharks can see this greenish glimmer. You have up to 8,000 taste buds, but your pooch has just a bit over 1,500. The blue jay can imitate other birds. Its favorite is a hawk's call. The blue jay uses it to scare away other birds from its territory. Slow lorries are insanely cute and just as treacherous. They're the only known <laughs> venomous primates. They have a gland in the crook of their inner arm. It secretes toxins that can cause unpleasant consequences in people. The heart of beast has an amazing evasion tactic. To run away from other animals, they move in a zigzag pattern. Bottlenose dolphins have names for one another. Those are specific whistles. Hey, Bob. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Dolly. Hey, boys. And thanks for all the fish. Giraffes have long, and I mean it, black tongues. Scientists suppose this color might protect the tongue from getting sunburned. Well, that's all I got. See ya! The liger is probably the most popular hybrid animal, and an incredibly large cat. You won't see them in the wild. People most deliberately breed them. Lions and tigers don't even inhabit the same areas. So, a liger is a mix of a male lion and a female tiger, and they can grow to be very big in a pretty short period of time. They're actually the biggest cats in the world. Hercules, the largest recorded liger, is a real example of that. 922 pounds and 10.8 feet long. Imagine taking him for a walk. Ligers are mostly way bigger than either of their parents. In most cases, they behave and look more like lions than tigers. But they have some tiger traits too. For example, striped backs, and they're crazy about swimming. The Tigan. Nobody could fault you for thinking the Tigan and Liger are basically the same animal. I mean, they're both a combination of tigers and lions. But a Tigan comes from a crossbreeding of a male tiger and a female lion. They're usually smaller than their parents and definitely much smaller than their giant, could you call them siblings? In most cases, they inherit charming looks from their tiger fathers, but they get some interesting traits from their mother's side too. For example, love for socialization and the ability to roar. Hands down, one of the rarest hybrid animals in the world are wolfins. These fellas are a mashup of a female bottlenose dolphin and a male false killer whale. Its name might make you think differently. But a false killer whale belongs to the dolphin family. 
They're not even related to killer whales. Wolfins are such an interesting 50-50 mix and balance of their parents. They have dark gray skin, the perfect blend of a black false killer whale and light gray dolphin skin. Dolphins have anywhere between 80 and 100 teeth. False killer whales have 44. And their hybrid young is halfway, with 66 teeth in total. What would it look like if algae and a slug paired? No need to imagine. You have a green sea slug to check the result. It lives in salt marshes in Canada and New England. And it's possibly the weirdest hybrid creature you'll see in this video, and in general. Part plant, part animal. So, some slugs seem to have been very sneaky while stealing the genes from innocent algae that they have eaten to enable them to look like this. Since they're partially a plant, they can produce the plant pigment called chlorophyll. That means these unusual slugs can even photosynthesize. That's the process plants use to turn sunlight into energy. So they produce their own molecules that contain energy without having to eat anything at all. When scientists first discovered it, a green sea slug was the first case of a multicellular animal that's able to produce chlorophyll. What do you get when you mix a male leopard and a female lion? You get an interesting hybrid called a lepin. These animals grow to be almost as big as lions, but they still have shorter legs, similar to their father leopard. They inherit some of his other traits too, like a love for climbing and swimming. You can have a union with a male lion and a female leopard too, and the result is called a leopard. Male lions are usually around 10 feet long and weigh about 500 pounds. The female leopard is way smaller, only 5 feet long with a weight of about 80 pounds. The difference in size here is too big, so this pairing really doesn't happen that often. Okay, how about a buffalo and a cow? When you were little, maybe you thought that they could be a good match. But in reality, the combination creates an unusual hybrid animal called a beefalo. Not many types of hybrid animals can reproduce on their own, but a beefalo can do it. When a grizzly and a polar bear get together, it results in a growler bear, or pizzly bear, or grizzlar, whichever you like the most. You can see them even in the wild. These two types of bears have a mutual contempt for one another. Yep, they're not good at living together in a mutual habitat. But even though it's rare, the love can still happen and result in these cute caramel-colored hybrid growler bears. In most cases, they'll be a bit smaller than polar bears, on average 60 inches tall at the shoulder, and approximate weight 1,000 pounds. But they're well equipped for surviving in warmer climates, thanks to the genes they got from their grizzly family side. Now let's get to one pretty tough fella, the jag lion. As its name implies, it's the hybrid of a jaguar and a lion. We don't know much about these intriguing big cats because only a few of them exist. But there was an unintentional mixing between a black jaguar and a lioness, which eventually resulted in two jag lion cubs. One had a dark gray coat with black spots because of the dominant melanin gene black jaguars usually have. The other one had a lion color and the rosette pattern spots that remind you of a jaguar. Yep, you already know it. There are also liguars, a hybrid of a female jaguar and a male lion. That's some colorful family. Speaking of wild cats, have you ever heard of a savanna cat? Savanna cats are in both categories of house pets and exotic hybrids, since they're a mix of a domestic cat and a wild African serval hybrid animal. We're talking about striking animals, almost as big as a domestic cat. But what gives them their exotic look are their tall bodies, slender forms, and spotted coats. These cats are extremely loyal, intelligent, and loving creatures. Here's one unexpected mixture, a zebroid. Technically, it's a name people use to describe a hybrid of a zebra and any equine species. But when you pair a zebra and a horse, their young is called a zorse. Zebra hybrids mostly look like whichever animals they've been crossbred with, but with the striped coat of a pure zebra. Most of these hybrid creatures don't even have fully striped coats. You can mostly see the stripes on non-white areas of their bodies and legs. Speaking of zebra hybrids, check out this adorable creature. It's called a zonkey, or zedonk, zebras, zanky, eh, take your pick. They're mostly either tan, gray, or brown in color. 
you'll distinguish them by unique stripes that are darkest on their legs and belly. Unlike some hybrids, such as the Liger, zonkeys can normally live in the wild. In fact, that's where you can find them, living life to the fullest across savannas and open woodland, mostly in Africa. Can you guess what a geep is? <laughs> yep, a combination of goat and sheep, and definitely one of the most adorable and cuddliest hybrid creatures in this video. Geeps are very rare. Some experts even believe it's possible that they're not true hybrids, but just sheep with certain genetic abnormalities. After all, sheep and goats do carry different numbers of chromosomes, which means cross-species mixes are almost impossible. When a camel and a llama get together, you get a cute little thing called a comma. Similar to beefalo, the comma also produces the best economic traits of both its parents. The first one was born in 1998. Commas don't have camel humps. Their body is covered in soft, fleecy fur, similar to their llama side of the family. They can drink big amounts of water at a time, so they can survive with almost no water at all for pretty long periods. The koi wolf is a hybrid where nothing looks that unusual to most people, since the coyote and the wolf are not that drastically different in their looks. After all, these two species only diverged around 200,000 years ago. Now they're still able to mate and bring koi wolf cubs to the world. People living in eastern Canada and the US might be familiar with these smart adaptable animals that inhabit their forests, neighborhood parks, or sometimes even cities. These hybrids have emerged over the past century or so. And they've picked up the characteristics of both their parents. When a koi wolf is fully grown, it's somewhere in between the size of both parents. But it's also 55 pounds heavier than pure coyotes, and has a bigger jaw, longer legs, smaller ears, and a bushier tail. Check out the narluga, an extremely rare creature whose parents are a narwhal and a beluga whale. It's a pretty strange animal, but far from being lonely, they mostly live in the North Atlantic. Scientists had suspected their existence for decades. In 1990, they found an unusual-looking whale skull located in an Inuit hunter's tool shed in Greenland. People from that area said that there were other similar-looking animals, and they fit the description of neither a beluga whale nor a narwhal. People said they had gray skin, narwhal-like tails, and beluga-like flippers. Narwhals and beluga whales are similar in size, and they share a family, the Monodontidae family. So it may not even be that surprising that they're able to successfully breed in the wild. So it's a hot summer day, you're outdoors enjoying the weather. You want to lie on the cool grass somewhere in the shade just to relax, but ew, looks like someone spat there but it's actually a spittlebug's house. These guys sip a lot of watery sap from the plants, and when they process it, it forms a lot of bubbles, not less than 150 times their body mass daily. All these bubbles form a cocoon where young insects can grow safely. No bird or animal wants to eat this cocoon because it tastes bitter, as if you licked a Nintendo cartridge. Not so fast, cheetah! Apparently, Dracula ant is the world's fastest animal and the vampires in the ant world. They definitely win any burger-eating contest, since they're able to snap their jaws 5,000 times faster than your eye can blink. To understand how fast the Dracula ant is, you gotta make a video of his jaws chomping at 480,000 frames per second. At this speed, you'll see the ant slowly moving its mandibles. They don't run, but their mouths are rapid, and they move those jaws so fast, they even bend while snapping together. Now people can do that too, snapping our fingers so that they bend. The darkest animal out there is the IM-70 chicken. Not only these guys have black feathers, eyes, and claws, they also have black bones. The color is bluish black, and it is deep. If you ever try those chicken wings, they'll look as if someone had marinated them in blackberry juice or squid ink. They say Marco Polo was the first to have discovered these odd or charming roosters. Back in 1298, the explorer wrote about a breed of chickens that were as black as cats and laid the best eggs. This freshwater fish has been around since the beginning of the 20th century and probably remembers good old times with black and white and even silent movies. One big-mouthed buffalo made it till 112 years old. 
Still, the world's oldest creatures live in the sea. There are deep-sea sponges that are 11,000 years old, and they're safe and sound. This fish has incredible gills, which lets it hold its breath for over 4 minutes. Meet the coffin fish, a weird-looking but tough animal. They're also famous as sea toads. They actually look much more like toads, not classic fish with fins and scales. They can also inflate because of the seawater they gulp, so they expand just like a balloon. In fact, this superability lets this fish hold its breath for several minutes because they actually get the oxygen from the water they keep inside. But the absolute champion is the human. The world's champion can survive holding the breath for over 20 minutes. There are some animals that make their own clothes. Sponge crabs make a sort of hat from sponges to protect them from underwater bad guys. To figure out how the crabs decided on their outfit, researchers gave them some foam sponges that were different in sizes. The bigger the crab is, the bigger the sponge it chooses. They use various techniques to get this perfect shape, starting from cutting out a small hole for the head, and then they see if the size fits them. If they're good to go, they continue to cut and dig into that sponge until it becomes a perfect hat. Recently, researchers have spotted a moth that would drink birds' tears while they sleep. So far, there were only three registered cases of animals feeding on other animals' tears. These were some Amazon butterflies, solitary bees, and moths. Their regular diet mostly includes nectar, but it does lack essential salts that aren't that easy to find elsewhere. Not only do they drink birds' tears, they also drink turtles' tears, crocodiles' tears, and those of many mammals found in the Amazon jungle. Really? Crocodile tears? Some sea dwellers can emit red light. For example, the stoplight loose jaw fish uses it to catch dinner. Shrimps don't see the red light, so the loose jaw fish can spot any red shrimp emitting pulses of red light and catches it without scaring the dinner away. Mammals can glow too. A flying squirrel glows under UV light, emitting pink light. It happens because they're able to absorb light and emit it back in another wavelength. The platypus may not have the largest cheek pouches, but they're definitely the weirdest. They keep gravel inside those pouches to help mash the food they normally eat. Worms, shellfish, snails. These guys are toothless, so gravel comes in handy when it comes to chewing the food. It works just like a blender. Ooh, makes you wonder what they use for the mouthwash, huh? Now, if humans had the same incredible cheeks just like chipmunks have, we'd be able to transport our groceries right in our mouths. In fact, chipmunks can transport something as large as themselves in their oversized mouth luggage sections. Hamsters have the same superpower, too, and can even carry their young in the mouth in case of the need to run away. A baby carrot, which seems tiny for a human but significantly large for a hamster, can disappear without a trace in between those huge cheeks. The Mariana snailfish, which logically lives in the Mariana Trench, is relatively small. It's as large as two medium candy bars. Despite the size, they can easily withstand the pressure that equals 1,600 elephants standing on it. This fish has a unique body structure. For example, it has some gaps in the skull. If their skull was uniform and had no holes, it would never withstand the pressure in the depths of the Mariana Trench. Plus, their cartilage skeleton is soft and flexible. They also have no actual eyes, but they really don't need them since they live in complete darkness in the world's deepest trench. Hey, meet the Pinocchio frog! Not hard to guess, their nose can grow in size in the blink of an eye in various situations. Whenever they feel danger coming, it gets larger. When these frogs are calm and feel safe, it goes back to normal. It may also elongate when they want to attract mates, and probably when they croak a lot. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Do you enjoy it when it rains? You probably grab a cup of hot chocolate, cover yourself up with a blanket, and sit on the windowsill, looking at the drops dripping down the window. If you like it, you're definitely not a Myanmar snub-nosed monkey that's been recently discovered, guess where, in Myanmar. Their nostrils are so upturned and exposed to the outer world that they sneeze every time it rains. But if you were in a choir, you have something in common. 
Snub-nosed monkeys like singing together. Amazon Pink River Dolphins aren't born pink. Their young are always gray, but the older they get, the pinker they turn. It's like people having wrinkles when they age, and these guys simply get a different color. Hey, I'd like to get a little pink instead of those smile lines. You'd certainly love to be a termite because of their crazy sleep schedule. They actually never sleep, and the only thing they do is nibble on the wooden pegs they see around them. Well, if you're afraid of gaining weight because of a cellulose-rich diet, you could probably turn into a snail. They get a power nap for some hours and then can run without sleep for as long as 30 hours in a row. No fish can survive for any significant period of time without water, except this one. The African lungfish. When they feel something's wrong, they start secreting a mucus cocoon and go underground, give or take 9 inches under the soil. They have a built-in tube to breathe. Mountain stoneweed is, native to New Zealand, aren't afraid of drastic temperature changes. Their blood contains a special protein that doesn't let their blood crystallize in case of extreme temperatures. They tolerate any cold better than polar bears and even penguins, who live in the officially world's coldest place, Antarctica. Ring-tailed lemurs have one of the craziest ways of conflict resolution. They have stink fights. Taking into account the average number of lemurs in a group, about 20 or 30 animals, you'll see there's a lot of competition. Their scent glands are on their wrists and shoulders. Those on the wrists are harmless. The odor they produce is quite volatile. Those on the shoulders are nasty and produce brown, funky-smelling paste that would outlast any perfume. So back off. Psst, run. Really? It's not safe out there. There's a saber-toothed tiger looking around. You better be careful. What are you doing? Don't peek. Okay, just one little peek. How's this possible, you ask? That's because you're in virtual reality, of course. These cool but very dangerous-looking big cats were alive during the last ice age. What if they decided to show up at your doorstep out of nowhere? Knock, knock! A saber-toothed tiger is waiting for you to buy its cookies. Meanwhile, the coelacanth, this massive-looking fish, comes from a lineage that's been around for over 300 million years. We thought they didn't exist anymore until 1938, that is, when a live coelacanth was found again. Since then, they've been roaming the waters of the east coast of Africa and the waters of Sulawesi, Indonesia. Man, I wouldn't want to go for a swim and meet one of these fellas face to face. Their jaw has an intracranial joint, which means their mouth opens up by a lot. This is so they can eat large prey, like me. Not good. They're huge, too. Imagine a fish that's as long as you're tall and weighing as much as an average human. The takahe, a flightless bird, was thought to be gone in the year 1898. They're very cute, small and multicolored, usually not taller than your knee. But picture this. You're out for a hike in the Murkison Mountains. Looking around, you spot the bird you thought was extinct. But there they are, as happy as ever, surviving and chilling. A whole colonies of takahes was indeed found just 50 years after they were pronounced extinct. Good job, tiny little birds! A singing dog. Ever heard of those? Riley does sing sometimes when he's bored or hungry, but these are real performers. New Guinea singing dogs. They've been only recently discovered again in the wild for the first time in 50 years. Still, they were never completely extinct to begin with. New Guineans made sure they were safe next to them. But in the wild? Very rare and hard to catch a sight of. Look, there goes one. The New Guinea singing dogs are called so because of their famous high-pitched singing. They sometimes sing together, too. A dog choir of sorts, where they all howl together. I bet they sing better than I do in the shower. Not going far from this area, we have bats. But these ones are sort of different. You see, their ears are enormous. I guess that's why they're called the New Guinea big-eared bats. Clever. The species was found again when one of them was accidentally caught in a bat trap. Until then, I guess they were playing hide-and-seek with us, because up till 1890, they had been thought to be gone. 
they're still not out of the danger zone because of habitat loss. Imagine you discover a fossil of a species you thought had been extinct for a long time. Yet, two years later, a whole living group of said species is found. Well, this is exactly what happened in 1977 with the Majorcan midwife toad. It's sort of brownish in color with darker brown that makes up its skin spots. Other than that, it's just a small toad with googly eyes. The group of live toads was found close to where the fossil was on the island of Majorca. There aren't many of them left, about 500 in fact, and as of right now, they're declared vulnerable by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Now, are you a fan of tortoises? You will be when you take a look at this huge beauty. It's called the Ferdinanda Island Galapagos tortoise. It hasn't been seen since 1906, but on February 17, 2019, we were finally able to look at one of these beautiful creatures. It's probably out there with a few of its mates right now, but they also don't allow themselves to be seen. We only know they exist because there's a few tracks and scents. With yet another frog, we have the horned marsupial frog. They're out and about in Ecuador, in the Chaco Forest to be more specific. They're called this way because of their distinctive horns directly on top of their eyes. You know the pouch kangaroos use to carry their offspring? Well, the female horned marsupial frog also has that, except it's on the back, so it acts as sort of a backpack. They develop their embryos there, and when they're ready to come out, they hatch as complete infants, unlike regular frogs where they start out as tadpoles. One more toad, the starry night toad or harlequin toad. They're black and covered with loads of white spots all over them. Lost for 30 years, it was discovered back in 2019. Picture them as big bodyguards, water bodyguards to be exact. Oh, that's a very big toad on your screen. Well, for the Arawako people, that's exactly what they are, guardians of water. They also have their own name for them, guna. Sounds like a cheese. When scientists found them yet again, they came across 30 of these little creatures. But initially, they were expecting only one. Well, what a nice surprise. Here's a tiger for you, although it doesn't quite look like your typical tiger. It's called the Tasmanian tiger, and it seemingly disappeared since 1936. But then, out of nowhere, people started seeing them out there in the wild just five years ago in 2016. They sort of resemble dogs more than tigers, or a fox maybe. Just take a look at its muzzle. Maybe even a mix of both. Then, a few others started popping up too. And if you happen to think you're seeing one right in front of you, but you're not quite sure, check if they've got stripes on their back. They're definitely out there, but still technically marked as extinct by the IUCN. Okay, picture a horse that looks straight out of a movie scene. Tiny, gorgeous fur, very well behaved. It's tiny, but it's not a pony. It's a Caspian horse. They have an interesting backstory to them. They were discovered by Louise Leyland who got married to an aristocrat in 1957. Having moved to Tehran, Iran, she didn't quite like how the horses behaved there, so she took matters into her own hands. She took a few people with her, and off they went to the Caspian Sea Mountain. And in there, they found three of these beautiful tiny little horses. Well, that's how the story goes. Coming up next, a possum that was found in an unexpected place. Guess where? You have three options to pick from – hiding in a ski resort, in the Australian outback, or in someone's apartment in the bathroom. Which one do you choose? You have three seconds. The right answer is a ski resort. Yes, this possum is called the Mountain Pygmy Possum, and it's originating from Australia. So far, there are three different living populations of this tiny possum, but it was believed to be extinct until just 1966. There are fewer than 100 of them, so the IUCN has marked them as critically endangered. Also from Australia is the night parrot, an absolute delight to birdwatchers. Very beautiful, yet mysterious. 
these little fellas live in very remote areas. You can probably count on the fingers of your hand how many times these birds have been seen since they were found again in 1979. That's how rare they are. Have you ever seen a pygmy tarsier? Neither have I. It was only in 2008 that three of them were caught. Scientists don't really want to lose track of their movements again, so what they did was gift them with tiny little collars. This way they can live their life as happy as ever and will know they're safe. The last one I want to tell you about is the tree lobster. But as the name might mistakenly tell you, they're not really lobsters. They're just big black bugs with huge legs. Their extinction story is a sad one. In 1920, a cargo ship got stuck on Lord Howe Island, and it had rats aboard. These rats fled the ship and ran straight to land. Even though tree lobsters are bigger than most insects, they're still relatively small compared to rats. The poor things never stood a chance. Still, in 2004, life shone again for these distinct critters. A pair of Australian scientists were out and about on the island and came across 24 of them. All of them were living beneath one single shrub. Hey, if there's enough space for everyone, it's not small, it's cozy. Bottom line, it's better to be distinct than extinct. Don't you agree? Fail. Ah, oh, what a waste of an hour running around with a rolled up newspaper trying to get that fly that keeps buzzing around your head. Well, three things. Why isn't it afraid of you? And why won't it just fly away? And how is it so incredibly fast? Flies actually have a pretty normal speed for their size. You're just a bit too slow. A tiny fly brain reacts several times faster than yours to what it sees. One second to the fly feels like five or six to you. When a fly looks at you, it sees you as if you're hanging out at the bottom of your local pool, moving around really slowly. What if you dropped a balloon from your bedroom window and watched it fall to the ground? That's how slow a fly sees regular things fall. So it has ninja reaction speeds, but it also has special eyes. They're divided into thousands of receptors that capture light all at the same time. You use small muscles to turn your eyes and head around to look in different directions. Flies don't have these muscles. They don't need them. They can see in every direction at the same time, almost. No matter what side you attack from, that fly's almost definitely going to see it coming. You've probably seen supersonic planes in the movies, turning and flipping around at warp speed. A fly's kind of like that, but with way cooler wings. It can change directions mid-flight, stop, and dodge any obstacles. It can even calculate a flight strategy before it takes off. Well, this time you're really gonna swat that fly. As you raise your rolled up paper, the insect's brain calculates where it's gonna land. The fly immediately puts its body in the perfect position, ready to perform an evasive maneuver. If your hand moves in front of the insect, its legs immediately tilt backwards to help it fly off in the other direction. Wow, that fly would make a great boxer or soccer goalie. So why does that fly even bother sticking around? You're always trying to squish it. Well, because your body is a five-star feast and your skin is the buffet table with row upon row of tasty treats. Mm. As you move about your day, your skin releases sweat, proteins, carbs, salt, sugar, and all other chemicals that flies are crazy about. Imagine you're hungry and thirsty, walking through a desert. You come over a tall sand dune and see it. Free food! Tables of fruit, candy, sandwiches, and the world's biggest soda fountain. The bouncer looks big, tough, round. It's a giant slow turtle. Now you know why the fly sticks around. You're the turtle. You actually do have a chance to get that fly. But it's still going to get away 8 times out of 10. Say a fly sitting on your kitchen table. Here's what you do. You need to aim a few inches in front of where you think it's going to fly to. The fly brain will think you're aiming right at it, so you can actually outwit the fly and take it by surprise. The problem? It's really hard to predict the fly's escape route. So you're too slow. How about calling in some backup? Meet the tiger beetle. Speed, 8 feet per second. It can't fly, but that doesn't matter. 
This beetle runs so fast, it loses the ability to see while it's moving. It aims itself at a target and then runs. It's not a ninja like the fly, and it can't change directions mid-sprint. It has to stop before each run. You walk at around 4.5 feet per second, so the beetle goes like twice your speed. But for its size, it's incredibly fast. It runs 125 lengths of its body in one second. Now, say you're 6 feet tall. You have to run 750 feet in one second. As long as it's on the same surface as that pesky fly, the fly doesn't stand a chance. Or maybe it's time to call in air support. The dragonfly is the fastest flying insect in the world. This little creature can reach 35 miles per hour. That's faster than you riding your bike down a steep hill. The dragonfly's wings also allow it to fly back, right, left, up and down, just like a helicopter. Doesn't matter how fast the fly moves, it's pretty much game over. Flies, dragonflies, and tiger beetles are fast because they don't want to spend a lot of extra time out in the open. There are a lot of hungry creatures around. But there's one insect that runs fast because if it stopped, ouch! To meet a speedy silver ant, you need to go to the Sahara Desert. The sand here is so hot, you could fry an egg on it. Mmm, sandy. That's why the silver ant speeds at around 2.5 feet per second. It doesn't want to burn its feet. It also has triangle-shaped hair that reflects heat, helping the ant escape the scorching sun. If that ant were human-sized, it could run at 400 miles per hour, faster than the fastest car in the world. There's another ant that holds a speed record. The Dracula ant can't run as fast as the silver ant, but it has the fastest mouth in the world, um, other than me. It can open and close its jaws 5,000 times, all in the blink of an eye. Literally. How about another fast one, this time a bit closer to home, or in it? The American cockroach can hide in the walls, behind the stove, pretty much anywhere. It's almost impossible to catch. It can run 5 feet per second. That's because of its six legs. Each one has three knees. Its legs are covered with small hairs that sense any change in the air. That's why it reacts so fast when you walk into the kitchen and turn the light on. And the world record for fastest creature on land is the size of a sesame seed. It's a type of mite, and it can move at 322 body lengths per second. If you zap the mite to turn it to human size, it could go almost two times faster than the speed of sound. The mite can even change direction while moving. That makes it the fastest, most elusive creature on the planet. But let's find some animals that actually make us feel good about ourselves. The garden snail. It belongs to the mollusk family, and it likes to take its sweet time. If you were moving at snail speed, you'd take two steps every two hours. But snails don't care. They've been around for hundreds of millions of years. Snails use their shell for protection, but they have other tricks too. Some snails give off a nasty smell so that no one bothers them. (laughs) If it gets too hot and dry, snails hide in their shells and seal themselves in using that cool slime they make. That slime also helps them climb up trees. Sloths are the slowest mammals on the planet. Thanks to their slow metabolism, food can take up to 16 days to get digested. Wouldn't be that hard to catch up to one of them. But their slowness actually helps them. You know how in the movies they say, stop, don't make any sudden movements? Well, a sloth has that part down cold. Other animals simply don't notice them up there among the leaves. Manatees are one of the slowest sea creatures, but they're not too worried about anyone messing with them, except for humans in motorboats. They are huge, and they have thick, thick skin. It's like a sea tank, but way cuter. Another slow swimmer is the Greenland shark. It swims at less than 1 mile per hour. Like the manatee, it's large and in charge. No one's likely to challenge it face to face. But this all leads to the most hilarious snacking technique ever. The Greenland shark is basically slower than every single fish in the water. The only chance it has is to wait for some of those fish to fall asleep. Then it's snack time. The cool thing is that their easygoing lifestyle actually prolongs their life. The average lifespan of a Greenland shark 
is 300 to 500 years. They live in the North Atlantic and Arctic oceans. Imagine you're on a cruise and you see one of these slow-motion giants. It might be 400 years older than you. All right, you're scuba diving in the ocean, watching corals and colorful fish flitting by, when suddenly an enormous shadow appears above you. You look up and see a massive creature approaching you, its mouth a gaping abyss. Relax, just stay still and you'll be fine. This leviathan is a basking shark, one of the scary sea monsters that isn't really capable of doing harm to anyone. Basking sharks are filter feeders, just like baleen whales. They open their large mouths to swallow plankton and don't even have teeth. It's late night in the Central American jungle. You're out in the wild to watch birds, and you hear flapping of wings. Excited, you look intently into your night vision goggles, only to see a face out of your worst nightmares. Ah, don't scream. You'll scare it away. It's a perfectly harmless, wrinkle-faced bat, and it isn't interested in you. These are fruit bats, and wrinkles on their faces allow them to collect fruit pieces and juice for later snacks. By the way, their Latin name, Centurocenex, was given to them for their semblance to 100-year-old humans. Walking around a Nepali national park and deciding to wash your face in the river nearby, you freeze in terror. A crocodile is looking straight at you from no more than a few feet distance. Then it raises its snout above the water and you exhale in relief. It's a gharial. These reptiles have long and narrow snouts that allow them to efficiently catch fish and, at the same time, prohibiting them from hunting any other prey. While still carnivores, gharials are pretty shy and will slither away at the sight of humans. Right now, there are no more than a thousand of these crocodilians in the whole world. So let it go. Especially if it's a girl gharial. <laughs> You dig your garden in the backyard and notice something moving on your shovel. You take a closer look and drop the tool in horror. A small creature looking like a hostile alien is scurrying away into some burrow in the ground. Eh, no worries. It's just a star-nosed mole. These critters have peculiar snouts that look like they've been blown up from within. Their eyes are small and weak, so the star on their nose helps them a lot to move around and seek food. It's always on the move, touching everything it can reach as if the tendrils were tiny fingers. Oh, you're bathing in the ocean again. Well, look to your right, there's a real toothed shark going right at you. Nah, don't panic. It's just a sand tiger shark. Neither a sand nor a tiger one, it's a vulnerable fish-eating shark that slowly swims in the seas and chases its prey from time to time. There have been no reports of it ever attacking humans. But it still has rows of sharp teeth, so don't try to touch it just in case. It may seem placid, but you don't want it to get a bite out of you, do you? Okay, from ocean to desert, you're in Australia and longing for some water. You see a likely spot and start digging the ground only to stumble upon a creature straight from the depths of neither, all covered in thorns. It eyes you suspiciously and slinks away because it's just a thorny devil. Despite its ominous name, this lizard is harmless to humans. Horn-like bumps on its skin are for protection from predators and birds of prey. The thorns are hard, but as long as you don't touch them, you're fine. Now, if you have arachnophobia, it won't calm you down. But tailless whip scorpions you might meet in North and South America, as well as Asia and Africa, are more afraid of you than you are of them. Eh, tell yourself that. These nightmarish creatures don't have stingers and won't even bite when threatened. The worst they could do, and only if you corner them, why would you do that, is prick you with their front legs, leaving tiny puncture marks on your finger. Many people even keep them as pets, and they're quite affectionate toward their owners. Yeah. If you ever stumble upon a burrow from which a hairless, big-toothed creature is speaking at you, just don't mind it and let it be. Naked mole rats are the sphinx cats among rodents. They're close relatives of mole rats, but, well, naked. And they're fascinating in their own right, too. 
thanks to living entirely underground. They're almost totally cold-blooded, but can conform to any temperature outside. And their flappy, wrinkled skin doesn't feel any pain at all. So pins and prickles, as well as sharp teeth, don't scare naked mole rats. You're once again lost in the jungle, this time on Madagascar. Poor you. The night has fallen, and you seek shelter. But when you think you've found a suitable tree to build a lean-to, you freeze in terror. A black, long-fingered hand appears on a tree branch right above you, and two huge yellow eyes are staring you down. Then you see a shaggy face and realize it's just a lemur. An eye-eye, more precisely. This creature is native to Madagascar and only goes out at night, so you're lucky to see it. It fulfills a role of a woodpecker in tropical forests. It knocks on tree trunks to find bugs and uses its long, wizened fingers to reach inside. Tired of being scared, you seek your way home, but your horrors aren't over yet. There's a big red and white snake across your path. It hisses and lies in wait for you to move. You know it's a coral snake, a really dangerous, venomous kind. You stop in your tracks, and only when it finally slithers away, you realize it was actually a milk snake. They often mimic venomous ones, not only coral snakes, to protect themselves from predators. Still, if you're not a snake expert, it's always best to stay away. Okay, this creature will infest your darkest dreams. A giant African millipede. It's big, it's glossy black, and it has hundreds of tiny crawly legs. And yet, if it had googly eyes, it could even be cute. Perhaps that's why so many people keep them as pets. That, and because they commonly live up to 10 years. Giant millipedes can't really bite. Their only defense is curling into a tight ball and secreting irritating liquid from the pores of its skin. If you dare touch it, don't rub your eyes or nose afterwards. It's quite unpleasant. Goliath Bird Eater is another popular pet creepy crawler. It isn't dangerous for humans, despite it looking like your worst nightmare. This is one of the largest spiders in the world, and as its name implies, it sometimes hunts small birds for food. But they aren't part of its regular diet. The spider prefers worms and amphibians. Make sure you don't frighten it, though. It can still bite or release hairs in self-defense. The bite is similar to a wasp sting, and hairs can cause severe irritation on your skin. But mostly, this gentle giant is just shy and will crawl away at the sight of you. Oh dear, there's another snake approaching you, and fast! You're about to turn and run when you see a hulking eight-legged form cutting into the snake's path and leaping on it. It's another arachnid, and it looks even more terrifying than the snake. It's a camel spider. Not really a spider, nor a scorpion. These creatures belong to a separate family. They became the stuff of many urban legends, but in fact, they don't even have any venom. Sure, they can bite, and their jaws are pretty powerful, but camel spiders can't do much more to a human than just bite. They hide in the sand and burrow to leap on unsuspecting lizards, invertebrates, and yes, even snakes. And now, picture a pill bug. Not exactly a beauty, but since it's small, it's okay. But what if it were 10 times as large? No, definitely not okay. Still, such a creature exists, and it's a giant isopod. Thankfully, it lurks in deep, dark, and cold waters, so it won't ever come up in your backyard. Giant isopods grow to such enormous size because of something called deep-sea gigantism. Deep-dwelling creatures have to endure great pressure of water, extreme cold temperatures, and scarce food, so their metabolism slows down. Isopods don't move much, and more often than not just lie in wait until some poor small bug or crustacean crawls within their reach and they can munch on it. And though it looks like a many-legged chaos from below, a giant isopod can hurt you even if it wanted to. Just pet it already.